Afternoon and evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Harry Brelsford here from SMB Nation with an encore set of webinars. So this this is like having a weekly webinar three weeks in three days, if, if you want to put it in perspective. So totally appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. A um, couple, uh, couple of announcements. Number one, let's go back to busy day. Here's what we're seeing out there is that people are getting busy. It's uh, after the new year. It's, uh, boy, before you know it, we'll be done with Q1. And uh, people are telling us that they're too busy to learn. That's always a warning sign, but I understand what they're trying to articulate. So that makes it more important that you've taken time out of your day to come. Uh, and today's topic is the 10 killer features of Windows 10. Uh, tomorrow we follow with additional content, and then and then on Thursday we follow with some uh, advanced topics in terms of integration with Office 365 and so on. Uh, we're coming to you live today. Grant and I are coming to you live from Microsoft Redmond, where we have launched our Nine City Roadshow. So this is actually our lunch hour out on the West Coast. But we've got a great crowd out here for Grant's presentation on both Office 365 and Windows 10. We will be in New York on Monday, the 29th. Um, all of this can be found at smbnation.com and click on the Roadshow. Click on the Roadshow advertisement to the right. We'll be in Atlanta and Chicago the first half of March and then onward and upward all the way through June 30th. That's nine cities. And then we will uh, reboot and do it all again in the fall. So that's kind of the major announcement that we have. Uh, time is short today, so Grant, I think we better just jump right into it, sir. How are you doing across the room? <laughs> Thanks, Harry. Um, it's a busy day here in Redmond. Lots of content and glad that we could get these webinars scheduled. Glad that uh, people wanted to see them again. So happy to go through them. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Grant Thompson. I'm one of the founding partners of MG Technology Group. Uh, my role is a solutions architect, and so I have a lot of expertise across a wide breadth of technology. Today we're going to be talking about uh, Windows 10 and go through 10 killer features of Windows 10. So let's dive right in here. Um, first, a quick story about my Surface. Um, so I've used a Microsoft Surface since the Surface 2 was released. Um, I'm on a Surface Pro 3 now and uh, love the device. Uh, but it, this story really goes back to uh, Windows. And um, at the time, it was uh, Windows 10. So I had upgraded my uh, Surface Pro 2 to Windows 10. Uh, the upgrade went uh, fairly smoothly. I did run into one issue early on, uh, but was able to get through that uh, through the new rollback feature in the upgrade. Um, unfortunately, um, one day I was going out to get in my car and head to work, and my battery was dead. And a creature of habit, I usually put my backpack in the back seat with my uh, laptop or tablet, whatever you want to call it in there. And since the battery was dead, I couldn't open my car door, so I set my backpack down next to my car. Uh, long story short, this was my Surface a few minutes later, jump-started my car, threw it in reverse, and ran over my Surface. Um, I did try to turn it on despite the massive amount of damage, and of course, um, it didn't turn on. And uh, so I was kind of freaked out, called my insurance company. Um, they took care of me, uh, went out that same day, got a Surface Pro 3, the one I'm using today and uh, came back to my house. I live on an island, so it took me uh, about an hour to get to a Microsoft store, pick up a new device, about an hour to get back. Uh, two hours later, I was back at my house and, and um, was able to uh, get all my data back on the uh, ferry ride back to the island. I signed into my Office 365 account. All my Office apps came back. All my settings came back. Um, and then once I got home, all my uh, data was restored from my local backup. So I logged in and it actually asked me, do you want to restore all your data? So all my files came back. Uh, long story short, in under four hours, I was back up and running with a brand new device. No lost productivity, not a bit of lost data. And that's all thanks to Windows 10 and uh, the cloud. So fantastic experience there. In Windows 10, uh, the start menu is back. It actually kind of came back in Windows 8.1, uh, but now it's back and better than ever. 
Um, so in the new um, start menu, it's familiar again. So if you're transitioning from Windows 7 to Windows 10, skipping Windows 8 altogether, um, you're not going to go through that transition functionality of missing the start menu and going to the, the full start screen. Uh, but it combines the best of those uh, between the start menu and uh, the start screen with live tiles. So you get information at a glance right on your start menu. Um, I don't read a ton of news, but I do keep track of a few subjects. So I have a live tile for news and the headlines for the topics that I care about show up on the start menu every time I open it. It'll cycle through. Uh, and then if I choose to read an article, I can just touch on that tile, and it'll send me uh, right into my news app. Um, same thing for uh, other things like mail and whatnot. I get bits of information uh, right there on the start menu, so it's interactive, uh, as well as full access to all my programs and search uh, and documents and things like that that we're used to. It's customizable, so a lot of people don't realize that when they first get uh, Windows 10, um, you can actually pin and unpin those tiles. So if it's too busy or not busy enough, or there are things you care about more, you can change that. Uh, if anyone's familiar with the Windows Phone interface, they really borrowed that idea from uh, the Windows Phone. It uses live tiles, and uh, you have the ability to pin and unpin things from uh, the start screen on Windows Phone. Now we can do that with the new start menu in Windows 10. It's also sizable, so if it's too big, you can shrink it. If it's too small, you can drag it and expand it simply by grabbing, like you would any other window, uh, the edge of the start menu, and you can drag it out or shrink it up uh, to fit whatever you need. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Windows Store apps. Um, you know, stores have been around for quite some time, um, and that model uh, has served everyone really well. So in Windows 10, we now have uh, the Windows Store available and advanced from where it was in Windows 8 and 8.1. And so now we have desktop apps as well as what they call the modern apps, uh, the, the ones that more uh, represent what you would see on a phone. Um, or on a tablet device, so now we have uh, both of that. And so those apps are consistent now uh, if the developer chooses to do that across devices, which is a fantastic thing. So if you use the same app on your Windows phone, then you'll have a similar experience on uh, your Windows tablet or Windows desktop PC. Um, so you aren't switching gears between the two different kinds of uh, the two different form factors, it's much easier to switch back and forth between those two. Um, the new modern apps are more mouse friendly, so we now have a, a title bar across the top that shows up when we navigate to the top of the screen, and that allows us to minimize, maximize, and even resize to a, a certain degree uh, the windows of the new modern apps, which previously would fill the screen of whatever device you were working on, and then you had to, to switch back and forth between your desktop. So now you can have those things live side by side with your desktop if you shrink them down, um, and they also change their form factor based on their sizing. So for example, the music app Groove will change from displaying a lot of information about the playlist and what's currently playing, and if you shrink it down to its smallest size, it will display maybe just some album cover art and uh, the next song that's coming up and the current song that's playing. Um, they're adaptable, um, it, which is what I was just describing. So they change their interface based on the size. Um, and that, again, makes the experience much more seamless, even if you're working on a smaller device um, that might be running Windows 10. Cortana, uh, this is one of my favorite features from the uh, Windows Phone that now is available on uh, the Windows desktop or uh, tablet using uh, Windows 10. Cortana really is a digital personal assistant. Um, I use it a ton on my phone for things like um, you know, remembering something. If something comes to mind, even if I'm sitting at my desk, I will often push the Cortana button on my phone, the search button, and set a reminder uh, for whatever it was that I was thinking about. 
Um, so you can do that now both on the phone as well as on your Windows 10 device, tablet, or uh, laptop or desktop. Uh, they also introduced Hey Cortana, um, which is a way to um, activate Cortana by saying the keyword Hey Cortana. Um, you need to set that up ahead of time so it's not turned on by default. Um, but if you turn that on, you can actually speak to your PC and say, Hey Cortana, uh, set a reminder. In fact, you'll see that window popping up uh, on my screen right now. Uh, and then we have better search. So Cortana not only has better search, but it also can be integrated into things like Office 365 if your company uses that and chooses to do that so that your search from your desktop will reach out into your cloud files and uh, data and gather information for you um, when you do uh, you know, your searches. So whatever you're looking for, you're more likely to find it. It also integrates web search as well. So you can search from one place and access data from your local PC, from your uh, Office 365 or cloud storage, as well as just from uh, the web. So one of the things that I really like about uh, Cortana as well is uh, Cortana will provide reminders. So since I use a Windows phone, it knows my location and detected, for example, when I first started using it, uh, that uh, where my place of work is because I frequented there. And uh, it would ask me, uh, after being there a few times, what is this place? And so I could tell it, this is where I work, or this is the grocery store, or whatever it happens to be. And if I set a meeting, um, uh, it will also remind me about the meeting, not only because uh, the meeting's coming up, but it will also tell me when I need to leave to get there. So I take mass transit a lot, and so I have Cortana set as uh, tra mass transit as my default mode of transportation. So if I have a meeting outside the office, Cortana will come up on my laptop as well as on my phone and remind me, you know, you need to leave now in order to catch the next bus or train um, to get to this meeting on time. I will do the same thing when I get up in the morning and leave to work. It'll remind me when the last bus is for me to, uh, to get to work. Or if, um, in the case of where I live, the buses stop running at a certain time, it'll tell me, you know, you need to leave now, otherwise there's not going to be another bus, uh, which is a fantastic tool and helps to keep me on time and on schedule. So let's switch gears. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the Windows 10 Edge browser. So uh, we've been used to Internet Explorer for many, many, many years, and Microsoft really worked and refined that. And it, it reached a point where Microsoft realized that in order to take the browser experience to a new level, they really needed to start over and re-engineer the thing from the ground up, much like they did with Windows 10 itself. And so Internet Explorer still exists, and Windows 10 comes with Internet Explorer 11 built in, uh, but it also comes with the new Edge browser. And this has been completely re-engineered and redesigned from the ground up. It's much faster and has a lot of new features in it um, that make it easier to use, um, as well as uh, add some advanced capabilities for um, surfing. It has integration with Cortana. So, for example, if I'm looking at the uh, office, the SMB Nation Roadshow for 2016 and I see a location, I could highlight the address in the browser, right-click and uh, say search with Cortana, and it's going to bring up more information about that location, maybe what business is there, that it's a Microsoft facility. Um, if I'm looking at uh, restaurants and things like that, it will bring up ratings and surface other information right within the browser uh, along the side of the browser. So a fantastic um, way to gather information, and it does a lot of that automatically for you. So as you're researching things um, or looking for information, Cortana goes to work inside of the Edge browser to really help you in that particular task. Um, there's also a thing called the reading list. 
uh, many times I'm looking for information and I may come across something that's of interest to me but not specifically pertinent to what I'm looking for and something I want to go back to later. Uh, so now I have a reading list uh, which is similar to favorites but different because it's something that I want to go back to and read not something that's necessarily a favorite that I want to go back to over and over again and so I can add that page to my reading list and then when I have the time I can go back to my reading list and see those things that I that I had flagged that I wanted to read again and I can go through and review those and then close them out um, on touch devices there's also the ability to mark up a web page so for example I can draw right on uh, a web page on my surface circle something make a note about something and I can share that with someone else where it'll take a clipping of the web page uh, and my annotation that I might have done with my pen and then I could send that to a colleague or a friend and uh, let them know uh, you know what was of interest on that particular page and, and add a little handwritten note to it Windows 10 uh, includes the concept of virtual desktops if there are tech folk on the call um, this is very different than virtualization um, which is uh, computing technology this is um, something that allows you to group uh, applications that you may be working on on different desktops uh, much like you might have uh, multiple desks in your office or a credenza behind your chair where you can set uh, you know a pile of papers contracts drawings whatever it may be uh, and then when you're ready to go back to that uh, project you can go grab that stack or, or gathering of things uh, and move it front and center on your desk so virtual desktops allow you to group tasks applications and things onto a desktop on your uh, computer the Windows 10 computer and then switch between these virtual desktops so you can have multiple desktops created and have different applications open on each of those desktops and switch back and forth between them very easily in addition to that you can move applications between the desktops so for example I typically have my email open no matter what I'm working on so I can switch to a different project where I might have Word and PowerPoint open and I can move my email application to also be on that desktop uh, so I don't have to switch desktops to go send an email or look something up in my email and it allows me to group tasks and really stay focused on what I'm working on it's very easy to switch between them it's very easy to see uh, what is running on each of those desktops it's very similar to a multiple monitor setup if you've experienced that where you have multiple screens and you can move applications that are uh, related to a particular project or task off onto one of those screens and so you can have all these different screens open um, this is a fantastic way without multiple monitors to simulate that and even with multiple monitors I use it because I really I have uh, three screens at my, on my desk at work and I, I use them all uh, so it's very handy for me to be able to have uh, my email open on one the spreadsheet open on another and then maybe one note or word open on another one and then I can switch to another virtual desktop that will clear my screens and allow me to set up new applications across all of those and use all that space and be very very productive the Windows 10 Action Center um, down by the clock there's a little icon that shows up and uh, it gives you much faster access to notifications and also consolidates notifications into a central place so we don't have um, all these different things popping up all the time um, it'll take most of the uh, Windows 10 applications and put all those notifications in a single place and give us easy access to it um, it makes it easier to grab uh, settings as well because not only do we see notifications down there but common things like Wi-Fi uh, screen brightness um, and uh, other common settings that we need to access frequently are there in the Action Center 
and uh, again that's in the lower uh, right hand corner of the screen and when you're on a touch screen a tablet they're also uh, built as little squares so it's very easy to tap one of them um, for example to turn my screen brightness uh, up or down I can do that very easy by tapping on one of the tiles that's for screen brightness and change that uh, just with the touch of a finger I do that often even when I'm sitting at my desk with a mouse and a keyboard, I'll reach up to my touch screen and uh, use the action center to change the, um, you know, change some setting on my uh, computer or access a notification that's come up. So Windows 10 core apps have also been remade and redesigned. Uh, the built-in mail app has been uh, completely built uh, again from the ground up so um, it is now available as a desktop or a modern app it integrates tightly with Office 365 or, or Exchange on so if you're using corporate email it functions well with that as well and uh, you'll have your reminders will show up inside of calendar uh, and because of the changes in the modern app now you can minimize those and resize those. We've done a fantastic job of redoing the user interface. So even without uh, Microsoft Outlook, you can, especially if you're a home user, you can use the built-in mail and calendar apps to keep track of all your different email accounts, keep track of your schedule, um, and very easily interact with them, whether you're using a keyboard and the mouse at a traditional desktop or on a touch screen uh, tablet where you don't have a mouse or a keyboard or if you're on uh, one of the hybrids where you switch back and forth between one or the other. Xbox. This is an interesting thing. People uh, ask me often when I bring up Xbox and Windows 10 because Xbox is a, primarily a, thought of as a gaming system. Um, it's really a media center um, and it's interesting because you get uh, integration with Windows 10 and the uh, Xbox so you can see the activity feed from your Xbox Live account um, so if you are frequently using Xbox Live um, or even infrequently using it you can see your activity feed right on Windows 10 keep track of what friends and family are doing on Xbox and you also can control um, the Xbox um, and do some streaming between Windows 10 and the Xbox. Um, so for example, I have an Xbox One at home. I might be uh, looking at something on the internet and maybe find a funny cat video or uh, something that might be interesting to the rest of my family. I can, uh, right from my Windows 10 machine, uh, tap send to my Xbox and it'll show up on my television so we can all uh, watch whatever it is together and uh, I can also do some controlling of my Xbox from my Windows 10 device so my tablet really becomes like a giant Xbox controller um, and allows me to interact with the Xbox and uh, from my uh, tablet and that runs right over the wireless network in my house so very seamless integration there's also a, a Windows 10 style update for uh, the Xbox that came out last fall so they've redesigned the interface on the Xbox um, so that we have a more consistent experience between Windows 10 and the Xbox so if you have an Xbox and it got that update back I think it was in November um, and you haven't yet upgraded to Windows 10 um, you'll have a very similar experience on your PC as you do today on your Xbox and when you upgrade your PC to Windows 10 you can take advantage of uh, all the integration the new integration between Windows 10 and your Xbox Windows 10 continuum um, so because we work on these different form factors we work on Windows PCs uh, we work on tablets desktops uh, phones you know there are so many different styles of devices we have uh, some of them are very small we have phones with very large screens uh, that are borderline tablets um, so we have all these different form factors and so Microsoft really took uh, the idea that we need to be able to seamlessly work between 
uh, formed especially for the hybrid devices. So I have a Surface Pro, but any kind of tablet uh, that has a maybe a detachable keyboard um, is going to adapt automatically uh, between those different form factors. For example, if I take my Surface Pro and I detach my keyboard, or if I fold my keyboard back behind the tablet so that I'm in tablet mode or clipboard mode, a Windows, the first time I do that is going to pop up a little box that's going to say, do you want to switch to tablet mode and do you want us to automatically do that for you or do you want to be asked every time? And so uh, depending on what you choose, if you say, you know, do it, yes, switch and always do it when I, when I change, then it'll know when you fold that keyboard back or detach that keyboard that you've moved into another way of interacting with that device. And even if you leave it manually and when you choose tablet mode, it's going to reorganize the interface. So for example, the start menu becomes more like the Windows 8, 8.1 uh, start screen where you have large tiles that are great for touching with your fingers uh, because you're no longer likely to be using a mouse when it's in tablet mode. Um, likewise, a lot of the applications are becoming aware that you've moved into this different mode. And so uh, things like the mail program are aware of that. And so the buttons get bigger and farther apart. And that becomes much easier to interact with those by uh, with your fingers versus using a keyboard or a mouse. Um, Windows apps automatically, the, the newer apps, will go to full screen. So whereas they are resizable, they will now default to filling your screen when you're in tablet mode. Likewise, the keyboard, the on-screen keyboard, will appear if you touch in something where you can type, for example, Microsoft Word or a field that might appear on a website. You can touch in there, and then the keyboard will automatically come up. And there's a little button that appears down uh, by the clock as well for activating the keyboard. If it doesn't sense uh, that you want to use the keyboard, you can touch that button and the on-screen keyboard will just pop up on the screen and let you uh, type whatever you need to type. Unified settings. So in Windows 10, um, we have uh, a new settings app. Uh, for those of you who remember the control panel, it was starting to get very full and harder to find things, although they did enable search in it uh, that made it a little bit easier. Um, the control panel still exists, so you can still go to the traditional control panel and still type in the little search bar there. Um, all the things that you're familiar with are all still there and accessible. However, there's a new settings app, and this is one of the new uh, modern style applications and it's built into Windows and that has most of your settings and they've redesigned the way that we find and interact with those settings so it's much easier to use, much easier to find what you're looking for, things like uh, turning on backup or file history, uh, things like setting restore points for your PC in case you need to uh, roll back after an update or uh, you know something happened to your PC you're not sure what and you want to go back to a previous point in time, changing display settings, uh, wireless and Bluetooth, all of those are in the new settings app, make it much, much easier and more uh, user friendly for you to access those things. And likewise, when you shift into tablet mode, that will work uh, the same way, adapting to uh, touching with your finger uh, versus using a mouse and a keyboard. So it's easy to adjust those settings when, even when you're in tablet mode, whereas control panel is a little more difficult to navigate with a finger. Um, again, the control panel is still available for uh, power users. The few things that are uh, not available in the settings app um, are still in that control panel. And if you just, you know, that's the way your brain is set up, you can still get to the control panel so they haven't taken that away. So one of the things I really like about Windows 10 is even though there's a lot of innovation there, a lot of new things there, the, most of the things that we rely on that we're familiar with are still there and still accessible to us so we can have that 
you know, similar to the start menu, and they made a lot of improvements, but it's fairly easy to shrink it and unpin the live tiles if you want to go back to a bit more of a traditional uh, start menu look. Um, although I love the new start menu, and I think they did a fantastic job with it. So I, I think we have, um, I'm not sure if Harry's going to come on or uh, at some point he was going to come on or do a little um, announcement. And uh, we're also going to have a bit of time for Q&A. So if people have questions, and I think we're just waiting for the moderator to come back online here. Um, so I'll talk briefly about um, the Windows 10 upgrade while we're waiting for Harry and the moderator for, um, to do the Q&A period. Um, my experience with the Windows 10 upgrade, of course, I upgraded pretty much right away uh, back in July of last year, end of July. And one of the things that uh, I ran into was I had a, a VPN client installed for connecting to a workplace VPN. And that uh, actually caused a problem when I went through my upgrade. Uh, when I got through the other side of the upgrade, my I couldn't connect to my wireless networks or even a wired network at all. All my networking was essentially turned off and I couldn't figure out how to turn it back on. There's a fantastic new feature in Windows 10 that allows you to roll back from an upgrade for 30 days from the time that you do the upgrade. Um, if you don't lose any data, so it's not like doing a backup and restoring the machine completely back to uh, how it was prior to the upgrade, all your data stays intact, but it will take you right back to Windows 7 or Windows uh, 8.1 if that's where you upgraded from uh, and have everything intact, and then you can try the upgrade again. In my case, uh, I did that rollback. Um, the upgrade itself took about two hours. Uh, once I was through the upgrade and realized that I needed to roll back, um, I clicked the rollback button. It took about 15 minutes for me to get back exactly where I was on Windows 8.1. And then all I had to do was uninstall that VPN client. And once I uninstalled the VPN client, I was able to get through the upgrade completely um, without any problems. The networking uh, issue was gone. So I still recommend folks go through and uh, look to see if they have a workplace VPN client. Um, doesn't affect if you're using just the built-in Windows VPN client, but if you have uh, something from a third party, I uh, definitely recommend uninstalling that prior to upgrading to uh, Windows 10, and then you can install a compatible VPN client once you get uh, upgraded to uh, Windows 10 if your VPN doesn't support the, the native or built-in Windows VPN client. So let's see if uh, we have some questions here. So if we do, you can um, type those in the chat window. And I'm going to look here and see if I can find the queue for messages. I see questions. Okay. It looks like a few people had trouble with seeing slides, and I apologize for that. I think our moderator stepped away. As Harry mentioned, we're actually at the first stop on our 2016, this is not mine, uh, the SMB Nation 2016 uh, Roadshow. And uh, I'm happy to share my slide deck. Uh, if you would like to shoot me an email, my email is grantt at mgtechgroup.com. That's G-R-A-N-T-T -T at M-G-T-E-C-H-G-R-O-U-P dot com. And uh, I'm happy to send it to you. Not a whole lot in the slide deck for this one. It's mainly uh, bullet points and things just to, to have a visual to um, follow along with. The screen is black now um, simply because I'm at the end of 
my slides. So if anybody has uh, questions about new features in Windows 10 um, or um, really any questions surrounding Windows 10, um, Office 365, or uh, Azure, I'm happy to answer those while we're on the call and uh, while we wait for Harry to get back. So let's see in the queue here. Uh, all I see right now looks like are is there, oh, here's one came in. Is there a good book on Windows 10? Um, I'm not aware of, though I'm sure there are um, some good books out there, um, but I don't have any recommendations for you. Um, one of the things about Windows 10, uh, Microsoft has moved to a different uh, development cycle. So they really have sped up development. Um, they have uh, different what they call rings, so they release internally into these uh, different rings and then to Windows Insiders and Windows Fast Track uh, and then out to uh, the general population. So things are changing very quickly. Um, so I would keep um, an eye on the Windows blog and uh, the, the Microsoft website for new features and information coming as we're no longer going to wait for new additions of Windows for uh, new features to come out. Uh, those things are going to be released over time. Certainly, I think we'll see a new version of Windows come out at some point, uh, but new features are going to be released periodically through the update process. I just saw Harry come in, so we'll see what Harry comes back with. I know he had uh, an announcement that he wanted to make, uh, uh, probably pertaining to the 2016 Roadshow. Um, and again, if there's any questions, go ahead and enter those into the Q&A uh, section, into the questions section there in the meeting, and I'll do my best to answer them. Sir, what's the good word? We've been waiting for you, Harry. Oh, no. Well, nature called. No. Let's go. Okay, folks, we're doing a little uh, thank you so much for your patience, folks. We're uh, just uh, kind of re, re, re jiggering a thing or two here. There we go. So we're coming back in, and then we have, I see the chat window over here. So, Grant, we have a few questions. If uh, folks, be sure to use the chat window for your questions. And again, thank you so much for your patience. So, um, Grant, let's take, it, uh, let's take it as we see it. All right, sounds good. So yeah, a couple of questions coming in. Is PPTPVPN supported or will I need to reinstall those? So again, my recommendation if you have a third-party VPN client is that you completely uninstall that product prior to upgrading to uh, Windows 10. If you're using the native VPN inside of Windows, um, you can go ahead and leave those VPN connections set up. Those uh, will not cause a uh, problem, but if you're using anything outside from a third party, you want to uninstall those. So, uh, you, you, using the native client, you can do PPTP or IPsec, um, L2TP. You can do all pretty much all the standard VPN protocols um, within Windows 10, but not all of the VPN hardware that's out there uh, supports the native Windows client. Some of them require their own. Excellent. Uh, next, next question. So is uninstalling or disabling antivirus recommended before upgrading to Windows 10? For that, I would check with your antivirus uh, or anti-malware vendor uh, to ensure that the version of the product you have is compatible with Windows 10 
Microsoft's gone through an extensive bit of testing. Um, over 10,000 applications, I believe, have been tested on Windows 10 to work. Um, and that includes, of course, antivirus and anti-malware. Um, there is some antivirus and anti-malware built into Windows 10, but you don't have to dump your third party so long as it's compatible. Um, so definitely defer to your vendor because there's so many different uh, variables there. Uh, likewise, I think it's uh, important to check with your hardware vendor. Uh, most of them, uh, as far as I know now, are fully certified for Windows 10, but there were a few that were late. Um, we saw some Sony BIOS uh, early on that didn't have uh, the correct drivers built for Windows 10. Um, Sony was just lagging behind a little bit there, um, and so they were advising their customers to wait until they had those finished, but that was wrapped up uh, about a month after general release of Windows 10, and so then people could safely uh, upgrade as well. Uh, next question, do I need to set a restore point for 8.1 first, or does Windows 10 upgrade create a rollback point without me having to do anything? Uh, you're correct. Windows 10 does create a rollback point uh, for you automatically, and you have 30 days uh, within which to roll back to that. Um, and it's not done through uh, Windows Backup. It, there's actually a uh, restore my previous version of Windows option that appears um, if you go to the Start menu and search for that, you'll see it come up once you've upgraded to uh, Windows 10. And that rollback is uh, uh, on my Surface Pro 2 took about 15 minutes. So even though the upgrade took almost two hours, uh, the rollback was very quick and all your data remains intact. It, it literally put my device right back into the state that it was prior to the upgrade, but all my files and things uh, were all intact, so those didn't get rolled back as well. So it wasn't a complete restore, just a restore of all the system settings. And I didn't have to do anything at that point other than uninstall that VPN client and then process the Windows 10 upgrade again. It went through that same about two hour process and came out the other side um, working just fine. Excellent. I'm trying to get around. Folks, be sure to use the chat feature or the, uh, Grant, I see that they're using the question feature, which is fine. I don't, I can't get that to render on my screen as well. It looks like you have a little bit better on your screen. Um, do, do we have other queued up questions? Like I said, I can't quite see the questions perfectly. I'm going to scroll back through here. I think, um, as I mentioned before, some people were having trouble seeing the slides early on, and I Understood. apologize for that. Understood. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, let's go back good. up. And I did give them my email address um, so I can send out the slide deck if they, if people need the slide deck or want to see the slides. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a different kind of lecture. I mean, it's not. Grant, I would offer it's not as intensive as some of the other lectures. The, the slides are certainly helpful, um, but uh, folks, we'll do the best we can. So thank you for your patience. Um, Grant, I'll let you lead. I'm on a I'm on a smaller PC where I just don't have great visibility into the questions. It's not rendering well, so I'll let you lead on that. But folks, if you want to use the chat feature to ask your questions, uh, that's uh, great. <laughs> yep, that renders you can use more of a full screen. Yeah, uh, so you can use either one. Uh, somebody's saying don't see a chat option. Um, so and okay. We, yep. Okay. Well, then use use questions, Grant. I'll uh, I'll hand the talking stick to you for a second. Then, if you see some earlier questions that that we should hit head on. Sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, my desktop here, and so you can see a couple of the things that we went over. Since some people didn't see the slides, I'm going to go ahead and um, close the slides here. Okay. And let you, and that way you can take a look um, at some of the things we talked about, like um, Cortana here. Um, by default, when you come into Windows 10, you're going to see this big search box down here in the lower uh, left-hand corner. And so in the 
when I first came into that, that little search box being so large um, drove me nuts. Um, for some people, I think it's great because it's quick and easy access. You just click in there and then you can search for anything you want to search for. Um, when I uh, got in there, one thing I wanted to do was make that go away. So I right click on that and go up to the Cortana settings because search is now integrated with uh, Cortana as we talked about. And I'm going to uncheck that show search box there. And if I actually click on the, sorry, I'm going to choose show Cortana icon. It's going to shrink that down for me. So now I can click on Cortana and get back to the search box. Um, but I don't have that taking up uh, all that room on my taskbar. Virtual desktops here are in this uh, thing called task view. So we talked hey, about virtual Brett? Yep. Hey, Grant. Let me let me uh, make a couple a couple of thoughts on Cortana, if you don't mind. Um, sure. One is uh, I, I was literally on a business call the other day where you know how the the biggest business decisions of your life can be made with a flip flip of a coin, right? So heads we merge, tails we don't. <laughs> and as you may well know, and you can speak to your Windows phone or you can speak to Cortana and have uh, Cortana flip a coin. <laughs> and it will come back with heads or tail, um, tails. And so that, sir, is you, you, you've been around the business. You'd, you'd be amazed at how unsophisticated it is sometime. Now, speaking of sophisticated, um, I'm still learning this, and Grant, I wouldn't expect you to know the answer because I don't know the answer, and I'm still trying to figure it out. But apparently, Cortana has a second meaning inside of Microsoft over in the analytics area, um, like in more akin to the Power BI community, um, a data provider, a data warehouse I'm pretty good friends with uh, called Versium is they're always throwing around the name Cortana, Cortana Analytics, and I'm kind of like, you know, I had to reverse engineer. I mean, I'm like, you mean your phone? Talk to your phone? <laughs> Grant, do you have any insights into that? I'm still trying to figure it out, and maybe it's for another day, another way, but di didn't know if you know the double meaning of Cortana, because it has another meaning inside Microsoft. So I don't. I'm not privy to that. I do know that there's an incredible amount of analytics that go on uh, to make the functionality of Cortana work. Um, for example, Cortana analyzes uh, email. Um, I should point out there are privacy settings that are clearly um, transparent. Um, ask, you're asked for permission to do things when you set things up um, so it's not reaching out into data without your permission and your knowledge, and you can easily turn that off. Lots of people concerned about privacy and security, so you have total control over that. Microsoft very transparent about that and very careful with customer data. Um, when I book flights, for example, and the email comes in, doesn't matter how I book the flight, be it through you know a third party or, or directly with an airline. When that comes in, Cortana will detect that there's a flight that I'm booked for uh, and will ask me if I want to track that flight. And then Cortana will give me uh, information about uh, my flight, if my flight's delayed, uh, what gate my flight is at, uh, and all those things will show up both on my Windows 10 uh, Surface or you know my desktop uh, as well as on my Windows 10 phone. So I see somebody popped in a, a question here about how to enable the Hey Cortana feature. Um, so to, to enable that, you'd click on the Cortana button and go to Settings on the left-hand side, and then there is a slider for Hey Cortana. When you turn that on the first time, it's going to walk you through a brief voice training. It's about six sentences that Cortana has you read so that uh, it can better recognize your voice. You can skip it if you want, but it's um, much better functionality uh, if you turn that, uh, go through those training steps so that uh, Cortana understands you better. Uh, and it works quite well, um, as you may have may have seen, or maybe you saw the, the uh, black screen. Uh, during uh, the presentation earlier um, where I said those the uh, hey Cortana keywords and Cortana actually popped up right on on top of my presentation because it was close enough to my PC for it to, de to detect that phrase. There you go. 
so so Grant, I think you were going to do the virtual desktop thing. I I, I oh I, yes, I kind of t took over there for a second. No problem, no worries. Um, so down here in the lower left-hand corner uh, by the Start button is Task View. And when I click on that, you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, I have Desktop 1 and Desktop 2. On the right-hand side, I can create a new desktop so I can add uh, a third desktop and then be able to move applications between those. Um, so when I hover over my Desktop 1, for example, I can see my PowerPoint slides I can right click on that and I can move it to desktop 3 and then when I click on desktop 3 now I have my uh, just my PowerPoint presentation and the other applications are turned off and then to switch desktops I can click on task view again and uh, gr go grab desktop 1 and my PowerPoint presentation if you can see here is not running there and if I say oh gosh well I really wanted it on desktop 1 I can easily switch back to desktop three, right click on uh, the application, and then go back, move it back to desktop one, and then now my PowerPoint is back there. So very easy to move applications between those desktops, to add new desktops, um, or to close desktops. And again, that's very useful if you do any kind of project work, being able to group applications um, and things together especially if you're not working on multiple monitors or if you're mobile and being able to have that same kind of focus and productivity um, built right into Windows 10. Um, so next question we've got here is uh, what is the memory impact of multiple desktops? Well, those applications are running on your PC the same as they would be in a single desktop, so there's really no additional overhead, but obviously all those applications are running on the PC. They're not sleeping when they're um, on the other desktop, um, so they're going to be consuming uh, resources there. Great thing to point out that the system requirements have not changed for Windows 10 since Windows 7, actually. So if your device runs Windows 7 pretty well, it's going to run Windows 10 pretty well. Uh, and so that's a great thing, not having to uh, do, go through a hardware upgrade, uh, needing to add memory and things. Obviously, the application requirements may differ, and uh, developers tend to increase the requirements their applications have. But uh, for the most part, I have not seen anyone go from Windows 7 or Windows 8 to Windows 10 and find that the hardware that they uh, had previously was inadequate. Hey, Grant, just a sanity check, sir. We have um, about five minutes left. Uh, today we are, folks, if you join us late, we're coming to you live from Microsoft Redmond deep inside building 37. That's actually the Windows 10 building. And <clears throat> we have launched today a nine-city road show uh, that features Office 365 and Windows 10. Um, Grant's our primary speaker, and if you would like to join us next Monday in New York or uh, the first part of March in Atlanta or Chicago and then onward and upward to other cities, go to smbnation.com, click over on the motorcycle icon, the roadshow ad over on the right, and uh, sign up for the city of your choice. Plus, we plan to do another nine cities in the second half of the year, typically Grant NFL cities, so there you are. Grant, one or two more questions, and then we probably better start to wrap. Got it. Um, so just a, uh, one comment from somebody on the call who says that uh, they'll see us in Phoenix, which is fantastic. I'm very privileged to be part of the roadshow and, and be invited back um, to speak. We've got a lot of great content. Um, again, we're live in Redmond um, in the middle of, of the roadshow on lunch break right now. We have sessions on uh, Office 365 and Azure Active Directory, um, sessions on Windows 10. I'm going to, uh, this afternoon, go through an end-to-end -end deployment of a brand new Windows 10 device using uh, one of the new deployment tools. We'll talk about Office 365 security. Um, and uh, we will also uh, have content from some other speakers here talking about uh, the Microsoft CSP program. Just an incredibly packed day uh, with a lot of great information, great community, um, and I look forward to seeing you guys uh, at one of the cities on the tour.
And I think I think what's important, Grant, as we start to bring this uh, session to a close, is um, it's updated content, folks. So we respect uh, your time and your commitment. And yes, we came through a year ago. We did the tour a year ago. Some of the same cities, some new cities this time. But we updated the decks, uh, so it's meaningful to you. You can certainly come again and again and again. And Grant, the one I'm excited about was the uh, one of the later courses we added on Office 365 and security with uh, uh, threat analytics. Um, I'm not the bag, cat out of the bag completely about what we talk about, but you know that seems like a, a timely conversation. Versus Grant, I would offer. I don't know that we need. I don't know that the world needs us to fly around and talk about uh, what is Office 365. I think, I think people got that part, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly we've moved uh, beyond that. Office 365 being uh, Microsoft's fastest growing product ever, which is quite incredible considering the popularity of some of the products and services that they offer. Uh, most people know what it is, uh, a lot of people are using it, uh, and we've now uh, added or created new content for uh, this year to start diving deeper into things. I'm most excited that some of the sessions that I'm doing are a little bit longer than we did last year. Last year was a fantastic tour. Um, this year we're doing um, some sessions with some more technical uh, deep dives where we're actually clicking buttons and uh, and making things happen so that people walk away not only with a, a good amount of information but also hands-on training of how to take advantage of some of the features in in these products. Yeah, yeah, I no, I would concur. In fact, that 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 was actually your idea. <laughs> so that's why I'm excited um, about it. <laughs> So no, folks, but you know, we, we pride ourselves on an independent view looking in with our webinars, with our workshops. Um, Grant, I, unfortunately, I kind of need to make that the final word. We're at the top of the hour, and sir, you're due on stage again in 10 minutes out here in Building 37 in Redmond. So uh, I, I, I want to you know, just thank everybody for attending. We will see you tomorrow at noon Pacific. And Grant, I'll let you have the final words, sir, before we close it out. Oh, thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. These are, uh, you know, packed full of content tomorrow and the following day. And if we're coming to a city near you, I hope that I can meet you in person. Appreciate everybody's time, and uh, we will talk to you tomorrow.